we are doing another session of seminarian summary slides and we are going to be asking the question about the historical Jesus. We're looking at the three quests, what are commonly called the three quests that all uh, theologians typically study when they're looking at the Gospels. So the three quests uh, refer to uh, the three moments within, within the study of, of the Gospels that consists first of the first quest, which uh, talks about how Jesus was uh, unknowable, then how he was uh, knowable, and lastly, the third quest, which is how he's, um, you can even know details about him. But I wanted to start with this, um, this image, this quote that I found when I was preparing this, and I think it actually is very helpful to show how this is all very pertinent. How we're going to be looking at the different authors and seeing their faces. And in many ways, we're going to look at just the, the characters of the three quests, the, the main personalities, which are familiar to Biblis, but to a lot of other people, they're not that well known, or they even, you've never even heard of them, probably. So I think it's good to know uh, where a lot of the ideas that we hear about come from. But I wanted to start with this um, Hans Kunzelman. This is a quote which I thought was uh, really interesting. And uh, I thought this quote was interesting just because it's considered like common knowledge, but also because it's, uh, it's, <laughs> well, anyway, I'll, you'll see why I think it's humorous. The Christian community continues to exist because the conclusions of the critical study of the Bible are largely withheld from them. In other words, uh, Christianity exists because, because people are ignorant. It's pretty much what it's saying. The church continues to exist because people are ignorant. And um, what I thought of when I looked at this quote, for most people, they look at this quote and they're just like, oh, okay, he has a point. He looks like a nice guy. He looks really intelligent. He has glasses on. When I looked at this, the first thing I thought was, uh, is that guy really Hans Kunzelman? Because I know a little bit about, uh, about when he lived, and I think he, he died around like 1980s. And this guy, okay, he could have died then. But in the 1980s, he was 70. I, I don't think he looks 70. Anyways, I asked, I asked myself like three questions. One, uh, why is it that like Wikipedia has no photo of him? It's like this quote that they put with Hans Kunzelman, they put it without, uh, they put it with a photo, but is this photo even him? Like I have a serious, I have a serious doubt. Um, does he look like he's 70 years old? He was from 1915 to, to 1989. Uh, okay, that's pretty weird to begin with. But then here's the, ne the, next, the next thing. I looked up the quote that was actually written here because I was saying, you know what, I don't think he would even, I'm not even sure he would say this, like knowing a little bit about him. And the quote is from page 143 of The, His the Secret History of the World and How to Get Out Alive. Like, I look at a book that has like horns coming out of like some sort of St. Peter figure and I get a little bit nervous. I don't, maybe other people don't, but I do. And I, I looked up like reviews of this book and this was one of the books, uh, one of the reviews that came up. Uh, just listen to this. I bought this book because I became interested in high strangeness. Oh, okay. Alchemy, nature of reality and the hidden history of the world. I am on a trip of discovery and have been looking for illuminating books to help me along to understand myself, myself. Like, just think about that. That's, from a Christian point of view, that's actually quite scary. And the world. So this is, the quote continues. I want to continue it because I think it is interesting. Why do I give one, just this, why do I give this one, uh, just one single star? Because as the pages roll on and on, you sense an ignorance rising from the author's words. She dismisses most of the esoteric and their cult theories out of hand and does not seem to understand most of them. In other words, the person who wrote this book didn't even understand uh, the esoteric theories. <laughs> anyway, just one, one absurdity after another. But the thing that, that struck me the most is that this is the book where this quote is taken from, as far as I know. Maybe it comes from some other, maybe he says it somewhere else as well, but uh, maybe it doesn't. Anyway, it's kind of interesting to think that a quote on how uh, the Catholic theolog theology and Catholic criticism is, is uh, not, large, not uh, correctly founded as acritical uh, comes from a book which is not very critical. And I haven't seen it quoted anywhere else. Maybe it is. 
that it's even in this book it says it comes from a lecture. In other words, it's not something which he even wrote down. Okay, so I just wanted to begin by being critical of someone who says that we're not critical. And uh, this is this is just the slide that shows like the three the three quests. Just as a summary, like the first quest, the first cue, uh, is the idea is that we can't know Jesus. And this is a huge amount of the first people we're going to be looking at, all of them. Like the first 12 are all have this same opinion. But it's, it's important to realize that this is a really common opinion. And a lot of people just stay in the first quest because it is very influential. Uh, the second quest is also very important precisely because uh, not only is it uh, a continuation of the first of the first quest, but it's also adding light. In other words, it's saying that we can know something, and that we can know things which are very important. And lastly, we're going to look at just how these studies have expanded today. The third quest. Okay, we're going to start with the first. Uh, your man Ray Maus. Now, Ray Maus. First of all, he said. Uh, he, he didn't publish his works, but he had a, a work of 4,000 manuscripts, and these were public by Lessing, the guy on the, the, guy on the screen over there. And Lessing uh, published them, and he was actually uh, persecuted, so to speak, by the government even at the time. And it's interesting because all these like, manuscripts that, that Ray Maus wrote and Lessing published, the interesting thing about them is that they start off a very big movement. They, they say that, first of all, the Gospels are false. But the most interesting thing is why they say they're false. They say they're false because there are contradictions. This is an interesting point. And we recognize, this is the interesting thing, as Catholics, we recognize that there are contradictions in the Gospels. We recognize it. We accept it. But that's not the end of the story. The interesting this is the beginning with Ray Maus, this is the beginning of where it becomes critical. It's true that the fathers of the church were also critical. Augustine and others, they were also critical. They weren't just, just believe-it-alls or, or fools. Uh, but this is where it's modern criticism begins, by recognizing that the gospel does have contradictions. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Lessing also even wrote a play on uh, Nathan the Wise, and he talks about how with his uh, modern ideology, with his liberalism, he talks about how all the religions are equal. And he ends by saying can't, pretty much the idea, just why don't we just live in peace even if, uh, even if Christianity is better, which insulted the Jews, and he got himself into, a, into trouble. But it was, it's interesting to see that even that play that he uh, proposed continues to exist today. Okay. Okay, we're gonna just run through. I think it was important to Ray Maus to just explain like how it all started, but now we're gonna just run through a bunch of other authors just pretty quickly. But I think it's good just to so that they at least ring a bell for us as as Catholics, and as also if we're just Christians, just trying to learn a little bit about uh, about the different biblical criticism, just to look at the names and look at the at the people involved. So we're gonna look through them quickly. Shale Macker. Look, Shail Makad, one of the main things he did is he asked the question, okay, the Gospels are different, they contradict each other. So he asked the question, okay, which one's the best? And his conclusion was, well, John's is the best because it's the best ordered. It's a pretty simple, simple idea. But if you look at Bauer, he asked the same question, which is uh, very similar anyway. He said, which is the worst? And his conclusion was Mark's Gospel, the worst, because it's just a summary of Matthew and uh, Luke just put together, but put together bad. <laughs> it's kind of interesting because the irony behind this is that the biblical scholars, you can almost guess that someone's a biblical scholar because they end up quoting Mark. In other words, modern biblical scholarship loves the gospel of Mark. We'll, hopefully we'll see why in later, in later episodes of Seminary and Summary Slides. But for a moment, we can just see how it's, how it's so important, the gospel of Mark, precisely because it's raw, because it shows uh, a lot of details which which are un, uh, which would be scandalous, so to speak. Scandalous in the sense that they're, uh, they're, they're, not exp they're not watered down. We'll look at this later on. But for the moment, it's good to recognize that Mark is not looked down upon nowadays. David Strauss. 
Now, Strauss said that it was the Gospels were a myth. Now, he wrote over uh, 1,400 pages, so he wrote a lot to say this, but the main idea he's saying is that the Gospels are myths, that we can't, we can't know what the, the actual facts of the Gospels. And it's interesting how much he, this, this man influenced also Nietzsche. He found his, his writings fascinating. But it's, it's true, yeah, he had studies, but this, the fact that there are contradictions uh, and that it, does, uh, it can seem mythological doesn't mean that it's necessarily a myth. Adolf von Harnack. This man also, he recognizes that the Gospels are, uh, he would also say that the Gospels are a myth, but his conclusion is, let's just love. You know, he says, okay, and these guys, these guys are not, I mean, I'm simplifying all of this very much so, and those who know about this will hopefully forgive me, but the, his thing is, okay, we, it's a myth, but we should still love each other. And he, he has a point, but that's, there's, we can't just, just be like, okay, I just, so the Gospels are fake. No, you can't say that. <laughs> That's a big deal. So you have, to, you, have to, uh, you have to look at the facts and go deeper into this. You have to get at least to the second quest. Okay, William Reed. With William Reed, he recognizes that the Gospels have plots. He recognizes that they, are, that they have plots. He recognizes that they're theological plots. In other words, that the climax is theological. And this is already a huge, this is already a huge step. Uh, notice the fact that he doesn't he doesn't go against he doesn't go directly against the fact that it's a myth which has to be dealt with the fact that somebody says it's just a myth but let's just just take that one step at a time and say okay with Reed we say that's interesting that it is a theological plot it's a huge step and each of these people does base it on different gospels like this is also uh, the the secret uh, this is also the messianic secret this last one of Reed what we we're just looking at. But it's, it's interesting that each of them is a specialist on different aspects or uh, different parts of the Gospels. So we looked at the first, first row. We looked at six. Now we're going to look at the next group. So Martin Kallert, Kallert. The interesting thing about him is that he says, okay, uh, he recognizes that we might not, they might be mythological, whatever. But he, uh, he says that they are, like each aspect of the Gospel is referring to the to the kerygma. Each of it is referring to the Paschal mystery. In the same way that a, a, a little dot of dew is reflecting the is reflecting the sunrise or the sunset. In the same way every aspect of the gospel is uh, charismatic. Like everything is referring to the passion. In other words, like the whole gospel of Mark would be a whole introduction to the passion. Like everything is looking towards the passion, just like the dew. So that's a, it's, an it's an important detail, but it's actually uh, going deeper. Like even though they're recognizing they're, they haven't really dealt with important issues, but they are recognizing, hey, even within this, there's some order even within the Gospels themselves. Johannes Weiss. You got to love the picture with his kid. Like the one picture you find of him is with his kid, which is pretty class. Family guy. Uh, his thing is above all that the Gospels, he wouldn't say, uh, he, would, he would agree that they have a common unity, and he would say that it's an eschatological unity. So he would say that it's it's about the eschaton. Just just we're just giving like we're, we're painting with a with a, a one a one meter brush here. But anyway, the uh, this other man Albert Schweitzer is an interesting character for several reasons. Uh, one is the fact that he has four doctorates, which is not normal. Like you might have somebody with one, somebody with two, but most people don't have four doctorates. So he had a doctorate in theology. He had a doctorate in, in music. He had a doctorate in, in medicine and a doctorate, medicine, music, theology, I'm missing one. Anyway, he had four doctorates, even if I can't remember exactly what the other one was. And the, and the thing is he also won the Nobel Peace, the Nobel Peace Prize, which is uh, in 1952. And uh, he was also, I also have a, a picture here of, of another um, person. I can't remember his name. I'm going to check. <laughs> <laughs> One second. Uh, Renan, that's his name. The guy, Ernst Renan, 
was was also another character was also another person who uh, who actually was Albert uh, Schweitzer also spoke very well of him but the, the interesting thing about it was that he wrote a life of Jesus which wasn't uh, which was hugely popular but it wasn't the most uh, intellectual of of the works in the sense that it was a work which he did uh, which he wrote which is interesting he wrote it after his sister died when he was visiting Palestine and other areas of the East and he wrote it with the gospel and with uh, the writings of Josephus but it wasn't a work which was highly in which was uh, so rigorously wasn't as rigorously intellectual as the other authors that were that we're looking at even if we're summarizing them in a very simple way okay the main thing that that um, um, the, the main thing that Albert Schweitzer was looking at was that he was criticizing those who came before him. But the interesting thing is he, he, so to speak, dug a grave and then jumped into it because he also made Jesus into something that he really wasn't. Uh, he said that Jesus, he made the, the gospel into a drama in the sense that he saw that Jesus wanted to accelerate the kingdom of God. And, uh, when he, and he, he went to his passion precisely to do that. It's, it's interesting that he, that he would say this, but it's also making Jesus out, uh, it's also making Jesus out to be something that he wasn't because as Benedict the 16th points out, Jesus, the passion didn't take him by surprise. He did, and it wasn't something he was trying to change the Father's, the Father's will. He was accepting the Father's will and the Father's plan was precisely the, the kingdom of God through the cross. So it wasn't something which he was uh, trying to accelerate as rather he was at the speed of the Father. But anyway, continuing onward. Uh, with Schmidt, one of the things he points out is that the Gospels are not, uh, they're not written chronologically. This is something which, thanks to him, modern theology also recognizes that they're not written chron so much chronologically as, as, they are, uh, as they are just fragments and more of we saw we saw before the theologically. Okay, Debellius. Now Debellius says that they were blinded by the light of the resurrection, that they couldn't. That it was just the charismatic influence, and that the resurrection in the beginning was the charisma, and that the the light of the resurrection wasn't able to let them think correctly. That's those aren't exact words, but that idea. Uh, okay, just throw it out there. Last one, Boltman. Now, this is an interesting one because, okay, he admits that uh, we cannot use electric lights and uh, we cannot use electric lights and radios in the event of illness, avail ourselves of modern medical and clinical means, and at the same time believe in the spirit and wonder world of the New Testament. In other words, he's saying we can't accept miracles. And he calls this, his method is what's called demetalization. In other words, he says that, okay, okay, we accept, this is, this is, uh, this is the liberal idea of the Gospels. He says, okay, we can accept that the Gospels are totally like hocus pocus, fake, mythological, you know, just miracles left, right, and center. Um, but it doesn't really matter because by believing, we can still have faith. You know, we can still believe. <laughs> and he doesn't deal with the fact that like, oh, okay, it's, he just says, okay, we can accept that it's mythological and we can't really know Christ. He just accepts that totally and just says we still have to believe. As you can see in the image, he's saying, Dear Jesus, I'm really going to myth you. So he, uh, that's, that's the frustration of someone like Boltman. So that's, he's a good summary of everyone who came before him. And he is, I'm not saying Boltman is, is stupid. He's not, he's not stupid. Uh, I remember at one point he, he commented to, another, to another, another author saying, Oh, what a pity that his first language isn't Greek. He said it in the sense that he knew Greek very well and others don't. Uh, but that doesn't mean that just because someone's very smart doesn't mean they can say things which are very stupid. Um, remember that the, say, uh, the, uh, the devil is a far, fallen angel, so he's smarter than Boltman, far smarter than anyone. Okay, now we're getting into the second quest. Thank, thank God. <laughs> but it's good to... I'm glad we worked, we looked through this, even if we did it very quickly. Just the first question, just seeing some of these authors and some of the things they say, even if they're very summarized. But I think it's good to recognize that a huge amount of authors and with their huge influence that each of them has, they've, they've said that we really can't know Jesus. That we can't know the Gospels, that it's just like, uh, that it's just, just a noumena, you know? It's just, 
like can't. We just can't know the Gospels. So that's that's that point. But thanks to uh, Ernst Caseman, he gives a lot of light. Like I think this guy is like one of the huge steps to just making things make sense. You notice he's kind of more modern by the tie, which helps to realize that's pretty recent. His big thing is discontinuity. This idea is so important for getting out of the trench that was laid by so many others. And discontinuity within the context of continuity. In other words, Jesus was what they were expecting. In other words, he was a Jewish Messiah. He was a, a good Jew of his time. He wasn't considered scandalous uh, by the fact that he was uh, by the fact that he was Jewish. He was he was Jewish, and he was visiting the temple. He would he he did the typical things of a Jew. He would dress like a Jew, act like a Jew. But there, there's also not only continuity, there's also discontinuity. In other words, he did things which were unexpected, which were, so to speak, as he says it, embarrassing. So we're gonna, let's just look at just one example of that. We could look at a lot of more. We probably will in future, future episodes. But uh, for instance, of something which is typical, you had him with the scriptures. He would have read the scriptures. He would have hired bar mitzvah. He would have become a son of the law by reading the law for the first time. And he, but he wouldn't have like offered incense to the the Roman gods. He didn't do that. He was a good, he was a pious Jew in that sense. But notice the fact that Jesus, and it says it in the Gospels, was baptized. This is very important <laughs> because if Jesus, if if the Gospel writers were so influenced and so blinded by the resurrection, they would have said, "Oh, we can't say that Jesus was baptized because that makes John the Baptist." look greater than Jesus. So we'll take that out. No, the gospel writers do not remove those things which are embarrassing. They keep them in there. This is really important. The fact that they keep in things which are embarrassing. For instance, in Mark's gospel, it says Jesus got angry. Like, it's true that in Matthew's gospel, they might change it slightly. and say he looked at them with anger, but the fact remains that the Gospels admit that Jesus was angry. These things are embarrassing, and they would have been hidden. Just like when somebody says that they're coming over, and, and uh, a, one, a mother says to the children, come on, clean up the house quickly, and everyone like, starts cleaning up mad, the mad rush. Is that, is your, did that ever happen to anyone else? Anyway, but that's typical. It's typical that you try to, you try to hide things which are embarrassing. And the same thing with the Gospels, but the fact is that these things weren't hidden. In other words, they're being honest. They're telling the plain facts. Okay. Colin, up to here? Following? Yes. Am I like going in circles? Am I making sense? Okay. Collins says it's all good, so I'm happy. Okay. Um, I'm going to, this is the other two uh, personages. A uh, Wolfgang Trilling, I couldn't find a, a single picture of him. I only found was his tomb, uh, but he has written books. And the interesting thing I found out, which it wasn't, uh, I didn't know, is that he was actually a Catholic priest. So he's another one who also uh, influenced, influenced in this, in this way, in the same uh, aspect. Hans Kunzelmann, another thing I wanted to say about him, other than saying that I'm not even sure if this is his picture, is that for Hans Kunzelmann, uh, he says he was a specialist in the Gospel of Mark, and he's saying that the center of Mark was uh, Luke, center of Mark, center of Luke, which he was a specialist in, was actually Luke 16:16. 16, 16, where it says, the, king, the law and the prophets were till John. From now on, the kingdom of God suffers violence, and all the violent enter it by storm. The interesting thing about this point is also that he's recognizing, he's building upon what came before him, and he's saying, look, these guys are true authors. In other words, they're basing themselves on the facts, and they're uh, developing that authorship. Okay, C.H. Dud. Now, Dud, one of the things that he points out is that they're facts. <laughs> the facts that it, it's, they are salvific facts. In other words, with the Gospels, with the contradictions, and with the discontinuity, but they give us facts, salvific facts. It's true that there might be things which are, might not all, all be sure. Like if one Gospel says that, he, that the temptations took place in one, on a mountain, on another it says that he, he, wasn't, he was put to the temple, Okay, those are, those are contradictions. That's fine. That's not the most important elements. The devil could have transported him to a mountain or could have transported him to the temple. That's not the most essential point. But there are other facts which are there, like Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> Very important. Uh, that, uh, that he died. And it wasn't just by mistake. 
but he prophesies his death ahead of time and on the Last Supper. Like these are these are other important that he that he was a man that he that he got tired that he got uh, that he got mad that he was normal, and these these are facts. And C. H. Dodd recognizes that, as do other authors. Okay, now let's look at the third quest. The third quest, uh, we're gonna just look at all all these uh, personages together. But I, I'm not gonna mention details. Uh, but I do want to just mention some of them and just say something about them. So with uh, John Crisan, one of the things he points out is that, look, uh, first of all, John Crisan, one of the things he's looking at is that the fact he's look, the third quest is above all characterized by a zooming out. In other words, you're adding more light to the situation by studying other details of archaeology, by studying the Jewish roots. For instance, Brant Petrie, I would put into this category of, as well. The Jewish roots of the Eucharist, Jesus and the Last Supper. I would also put him into this category of people who are seriously studying the Gospels and going deeper into them. Uh, also, uh, also in his in his his book, the the case for Christ, the the case for Jesus. He's also looking in this way. But I wanted to say, with uh, one of the things that uh, J.D. Crisan uh, points out is that look, if Jesus presented himself as a hippie, he wouldn't have been killed. If the apostles had presented themselves as a hippie, just love, peace, like Harnack, they wouldn't have been. They wouldn't have suffered. That wasn't the problem. Uh, the problem. Uh, the problem is that they 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 preached something which was radically different, and it was something which was radically different within the context of something which is which was continuous. In other words, they were fulfilling uh, Jesus fulfilled the prof the prophecies of the Messiah, uh, but he he wasn't just a hippie. The, what I have on the other side with the similar with a similar sign, is the, the Gospel of Thomas, which is called, as it is called. Uh, and the Gospel of Thomas is more just a moral gospel without the miracles. So some people want to reduce the, the Gospels to a Gospel of Thomas. But this is, this is ridiculous, because the, the heart of the Gospel isn't in the Gospel of Thomas. It's in the Gospels. Okay, Ernst Prosk. Someone, I don't, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Uh, with... With Ernst, uh, Ernst Trask, the mm, <laughs> I had something I wanted to say, but I just don't. I can't remember it right now, and I don't have it written down. Uh, anyway, with morale, one of the things he says. Look at just like the number of books he has. This is typical of an intellectual. But the thing I wanted to say with that he says is that there's no neutral history. Like they complain that okay, these Christians are influenced by the Paschal mystery, but you can't be totally neutral. Like if anyone studies history seriously, one of the things they realize is that it's not totally neutral. You try to be systematic and, and honest, but there is no neutral history. Okay. That is the main thing I wanted to say, and I didn't start off today with a prayer to Our Lady, probably because I was so nervous. So uh, we can end now with a Hail Mary, and afterwards we can take any questions if there are any. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God and our Mother, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. I'm here playing with my pictures. Okay, let's see. Any questions? No. Colin, any questions? Um, how did he end up like saying Thomas Aquinas and not like Jesus? That's a really good question. Colin just asked the question, how do you end up like St. Thomas Aquinas and not like these guys? Uh, the, that's actually a really good question. And that's, that's actually, we're going to deal with this in the next section. And I think I'm going to, this was not prepared, but that question is good, and we're going to continue with that. How do you end up like St. Thomas Aquinas and not like these guys? In a summary, the main thing is by not uh, reinventing the wheel. So you accept the good things that they say. You um, accept the good things that they say. It's like Ernst Caseman, like the whole thing of continuity and discontinuity. That's huge, and that's very important. And you also accept the studies that exist, which are very helpful, like Brant Petrie and others. And you don't have to be blind to have faith. 
Uh, thanks to thanks to reason, you can go and you can understand the Gospels even better. And and so the main thing is, first of all, to believe doesn't mean closing your eyes. So we can be critical and we can be believers, and we accept the facts. So we always accept the facts. Like if if we see that there's a contradiction between one gospel and the other, we're not like, oh, that doesn't exist. It's not true. You're a bad person. No, no. You accept the facts. If there's a contradiction, there's a contradiction. And uh, But we are going to look more into this. So that's actually a really good question. And we will uh, deal with this next week. But there's another question. Why is it important to know the three quests of the historical Jesus? Is it important for apologetics? Why is it important to know the three quests? Because it, it, you understand the context of the of the bi biblical situation today. In other words, we're helping people to understand uh, where someone we, we're talking to is coming from, but also so that we not live in a Catholic bubble, to think that all oh, these things never happened, these people were idiots, and I know everything. It's good to recognize that there are that even our even our enemies, so to speak, as some of these people can easily be considered. Even these who are our enemies uh, can are, are not fools. So it's good to recognize uh, that they're that they're not stupid, and to understand their arguments because it's it's better to to light uh, one match than simply to curse the darkness.